All righty, folks, it is now 12. Um, so we're going to get started. Um, if folks continue to come in, that's totally fine. Um, but we'll, we'll get going with this presentation about how to go solar uh, storage. Okay, so our agenda for the day is how solar works, um, deciding whether someone's home is right for solar, looking into some energy storage, um, and then incentives, and then kind of next steps for getting started. So I am Kate Henry. I am a part of Solar Oregon. We're a 42-year-old nonprofit um, that really focuses on education, outreach, and advocacy. Um, so we offer these trainings for how to go solar. We also offer some solar tours. Um, we have a Solarize campaign that we are working on currently. And then we also offer peer-to-peer -peer education. Um, so our work is possible through membership and donation. Um, we are a member-based organization. So I'm going to pop some links into the chat right now. Um, not all of them are relevant, but uh, there are some links to uh, donate or to become a member. Um, so if you want to take a peek at those, that'd be wonderful. It helps make us do our work and it helps us uh, make this work possible. So. And all of this work is also possible through Energy Trust of Oregon. Um, Energy Trust of Oregon is an independent nonprofit and they focus on providing access to affordable energy. Um, so they're part of the reason why we can put on this training today. Okay, so some kind of ground rules. Um, we uh, will be using the Q&A feature. So if you have any questions, please put it into the Q&A. Um, you're welcome to use the chat, but typically we just use the chat as a way to connect with your fellow attendees, um, but not necessarily to ask questions. If you have a question, put it in the Q&A because that's what I'll be looking at later. Um, we also doo -doo -doo, um, are gonna do a quick poll. Um, so I'm gonna start these off. If you don't mind, there'll be three um, in the beginning and then we'll do one more at the end. Um, but I'm gonna launch the first uh, poll and I'll let each of these run for about 30 seconds. Yeah, so if you don't mind kind of putting some information in there, it helps us uh, put on this presentation so we know uh, kind of who we're serving and what we're, what we're working with. All right, it's gonna go for a couple more seconds. If anyone else wants to do it, okay. All righty. And then we're gonna do next poll. Again, I'll let this run for about 30 seconds. I'm gonna let this one go for about 10 more seconds just to see if we can get some more folks to participate. But no pressure if you don't want to. Okay, and then finally this last poll, we just wanna see kind of what folks are bringing with them today, what information do they already have, um, and how can we kind of assess and then learn from and grow this information that we already have and share. Okay, I'm gonna let this go for about five more seconds. Perfect. Alrighty, thank you everyone for your participation. And let's get into the presentation. Okay, how solar works. 
So we have a couple different key components to a solar um, system. So you've got your photovoltaic panel, a PV panel. Um, then you have a DC to AC inverter or micro inverter. Um, and what that does is that takes the energy that the PV panel is collecting and it changes it to energy that we can use in the home because it collects as DC energy, but we use AC energy in our home. So we need to have that inverter and micro inverter. Um, you also have your home electrical panel. So this is where the inverter will be connected to. That then is gonna be connected to utility meter. This is a two-way utility meter. So a typical home has a one-way utility meter. But if you have a solar um, system put in, you'll have a two-way utility meter um, put into your home. And then the last kind of component is the utility grid. So a solar system will still be connected to the utility grid. Um, that's sometimes a misconception folks have, but if you, it doesn't have to be if you go, you know, um, but for, for most folks uh, in, in residential living or in kind of city life, or even if you're out in the country, you're gonna be connected to the utility grid still. So inverters, so there's two kind of main kinds of inverters. You've got your just kind of typical inverter here on the left side of the screen, and then a micro inverter on the right side of the screen. Um, these micro inverters are these little black boxes. Those are placed underneath the PV panel. Um, and then the kind of typical inverter is this bigger inverter here, and that's connected to your electrical um, system. So your electrical panel. Uh, with this inverter that's shown here on this left side, it's shown outside. Um, that's not necessarily the standard. Uh, standard is usually it's gonna go inside of your, your garage or in your basement, wherever your electrical panel is. It just so happens that this person's is outside the picture that we have, um, but not every inverter is gonna be placed outside of the home. Typically they'll be inside, um, but functionally, the inverter and the microinverter are the same. They both do the same thing, which is take that DC energy and change it to AC energy. Um, it just will depend on the specific solar system that you set up, and it'll be a decision that'll be um, brought to you uh, by your solar contractor. So the solar contractor is the person who you're going to work with to create this system. Um, they're the ones who are going to be putting it in, and each solar contractor has a little bit of a different take on what the best system is. So um, we'll kind of get into a little bit later, but you'll have a chance to, to work with some solar contractors to make sure you have the best fit. But the inverter is kind of the first step in the solar system. The next step is mounting. So there's two different standard practices of mounting. You have a ground mount and you have a roof mount. Um, roof mount is definitely the more typical and standard um, option. Those are what folks think of when they think of solar panels, um, those are those roof mounts. Uh, ground mounts are a fine option. You just won't really see it, especially in cities um, as much, just because you have to think about space that's available and, and what's being utilized. Um, there's also some different costs that are gonna go into these different options. So ground mounts, um, you have to run that, that PV panel, you have to run the energy to the home. So what you end up having to do is dig this trench that you're gonna run copper wire through. Um, so there could be some costs of you know doing the manual labor of digging that trench. Also that copper wire can be pretty expensive. Um, for roof mounts, you have to make sure that you have a roof that's compatible. So there might be some costs there. Um, but again, this is something that the solar contractor will go over with you deciding what mount works best for your setup. So net metering. Um, this is one of the more important uh, slides that we show. So I'll go pretty slow over this, but net metering is a major component to any solar uh, system setup. So we've got two different kind of sides of this graph. We have gaining credits and we have using credits and gaining credits that typically happens over the summer months and then using credits typically happens over the winter months. And so what this is showing is during summer months, you're gonna be producing more solar um, than you're consuming from the grid. So you have this net gain, this, these credits that are being earned. Um, so this is the, the amount of electricity in kilowatts. So you're earning electricity. And the way I like to think about it is you're kind of putting this electricity that you're overproducing into a bank. So you're getting credits for the overproduction of electricity that you're not using. And then during winter months, when you know days are shorter, it's a little darker, um, you're gonna be producing less solar energy than you're consuming from the grid. So at that point with net metering, you can reach into that bank and can use some of those credits 
during those winter months. So use some of those credits, then hopefully your utility bill will balance out. So that way when you're overproducing in the summer, you can use those credits in the winter. Um, those, those credits, they roll over month to month. So the start of a net metering um, life cycle starts in March and goes to March of the next year. So they do not roll over annually, um, but they do roll over month to month. And so you're gonna be slowly gaining these credits. Um, but overall, we're just looking at reducing your energy bill, which is always good. Um, we always love reducing any sort of bills, which is nice. Um, so next we're gonna be getting into whether someone's home is right for solar. As I'm going through these, I really usually like folks to think about their own home, their home, their own setup, um, and just kind of maybe some of these questions that you might want to answer, you know, get answers to or, or talk to um, a solar contractor about with. So the first thing to think about is a system size. So this is how big of a system you're going to put in. Um, you really want to be focused on how much electricity you consume. So before you put in any sort of solar system, you're going to be going over your electricity consumption with your solar contractor. Um, and they're going to be looking at you know, how much electricity you consume month to month, year to year, um, what makes the most sense for the system size. You also, when you're thinking about system size, need to be thinking about net metering is you want to create a system that where you're kind of zeroing out your credits, where you can overproduce in, this, in the um, summer, but then you can take from those credits in the winter, but you also don't want to overproduce too much. Cause like I said, those credits do not roll over year to year. So it doesn't really make sense to create like a giant solar system. You don't want, you know, your own like solar farm, um, but you want to create a size that makes the most sense for the electricity consumption that your home has. Some other factors to consider um, is what's the available space. So this is with both roof mounts and ground mounts. Um, you know, what's the space available for you to use? Uh, what's your budget? You know, there are some incentives and we'll get into that later, um, but you have to kind of think about how much, a, you know, how much money you have to work with from the offset. Um, and then also aesthetics. This isn't always important to folks, but it is to just some other folks of the, the look of their home. Um, the solar system is measured in kilowatts. Um, and the average size is about six kilowatts. So that equals about 18 to 20 panels. Um, this is a very broad average. Um, some folks go much lower than this. Some folks go much higher than this, but the average is about six kilowatts, which is about 18 to 20 panels. Solar access. So thinking about whether your roof has solar access to the sun. So what we're looking at here, you have two different pathways that the sun has, one during the summer months, the other during the winter months. And you can see they're kind of on two different trajectories. Um, the best, best location for a solar panel is a south facing roof. Um, east and west facing roofs also work great. Um, south is definitely the best. Um, where we are in the Pacific Northwest, a north facing roof will really, really won't do you any good. Um, so you're gonna be looking at either south, east or west facing roofs with south being the best. Shade, so shade is definitely a component when it comes to the function of your solar panels. It does um, impact the, the amount your, your solar panel is able to produce. Um, something that's important to keep in mind with shade is it can often be hard for a person to self-assess the amount of shading that's going to affect the solar panel. Um, you might think that there's this massive tree and it's gonna really impact your system, um, but a solar contractor or solar professional will be able to look at the shade and say, oh, well actually, you know, during peak hours, um, it's less of a problem than you think it is. Or it could be you're like, oh, my roof's totally free, no big deal. Um, and then they can look at it and say, oh, well, actually, if you look at your neighbor's house, it shades, you know, part of yours or something or another. Um, but it's something that your solar contractor will look at with you. Okay, and then next is roof complexity. So here we have two examples of some different roofs. So a complex roof and a more simple roof. Um, the best option is the simple roof. Um, Cause if you think about setting up a solar system you want something that's pretty continuous. Um, if you have a more complex roof, that doesn't mean you can't put solar on it. Um, it just means that you might have to either break up the panels or, or get a little you know, um, creative with how you set up your system. Um, there are some cases where roofs are too complex for solar panels, but again, this is something that a solar contractor, that professional will be able to look at and go over with you. And then one of the most important factors we really try to kind of 
hit this one home, is your roof condition and age. Um, so Energy Trust of Oregon has an incentive that requires 10 plus years of roof life um, on, your, on your home to be able to get the incentive. But that's also just a good kind of gauge or a very, very low minimum of the, the roof life. Preferably you would have more than 10 years. Um, and the reason why this is so important is because if you think about the cost of putting in a solar system, you're paying to put in you know, all the equipment. And then if you have to say after five years, replace your roof, you then have to pay for all that equipment to be taken off, to pay to re-roof your home. And then you have to pay to put all that back on. Um, so there's a lot of costs in there. So if you have 10 plus of life, um, years of roof life, at that point, you're already making your money back and you're already gonna be you know, contributing to, to the um, solar grid and all, and all those things, all those, all those kind of different components that make up the reasons why going solar is, is important. Um, but if you have less than 10 years, it's just the cost to benefit is not as um, beneficial. So some things to, to think about, if you have a metal roof, this really isn't typically an issue for, for folks. Um, if you have an asphalt roof, um, newer is definitely better. Um, so if you wanna go solar, you're really committed. Uh, it makes sense usually to wait until you re-roof and then go solar. So if you know you need to re-roof the next five years, I'd wait those five years and then put solar on after you re-roof, just cause that makes the most sense cost-wise. Roof structure, um, so kind of the, caveat of what I'm going to go into with roof structure. This is really only pertinent to folks who live in Portland. And that's because of the way the codes, the building codes work in Portland, they're really strict. Um, so this information I'm going to give is a little bit more important for folks living in Portland. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, so we have two typical basic roof structures. You've got trusses, which are more common in newer homes. And then you've got rafters, which are more common in older homes. Um, if you have trusses, the roof structure, this really doesn't uh, apply to you. Um, but if you have rafters, the way that the code works in the building codes work in Portland um, is you have to have rafters that uh, have a very specific roof span on them. And the reason this code exists is because there's a little bit of space between the solar panel and your roof. And that space, wind goes through it and it creates a lift. So what the code is doing is it's trying to protect your homes to make sure it's sturdy enough to uphold that lift. That being said, if you live outside of Portland, that doesn't mean um, without this code, your roof is in any danger. This code is just specifically really strict in Portland. Um, and so if you have rafters on your home, you'll have to possibly get it assessed um, and so that's something that your solar contractor will tell you to do. And what they'll do is they'll say, okay, you have to get an engineer to look at your, your home um, to make sure that the roof span is correct. And what the engineer will do is they'll just pull up your blueprint. They won't even come in person. They'll look at your roof span and they'll either tell you whether you have to get it um, restructured or not. Um, you do have to pay to uh, have that engineer look at your home and then you do all possibly have to pay for any sort of maintenance that needs to be put onto the rafters. But this is something that your solar contractor will go over with you from the beginning. Um, so it shouldn't be like a surprise cost or, you know, you're already into the project and then all of a sudden you have to, you know, change the structure of your roof. Um, this is something from the offset that solar contractors know to look for. So you'll be um, well prepared for this cost if it does apply to you. Okay, solar and storage my next section. Um, so what storage is, is it's energy um, resilience. So what we're looking at at this picture here is this group of homes, this neighborhood where the utility has gone, um, grid has gone down and all these homes are dark, but there's one home with lights on, that's energy resilience. It's being able to keep your lights on um, when the grid goes down. Uh, and solar and storage work together to make the whole system more efficient. And some reasons why we care about energy resilience are because these utility grids going down are becoming more and more common. Um, the most common reasons for grids to go down are squirrels and storms. Um, also becoming more frequent are public safety power shuts down. So as we remember last summer with the fires, the utility grid went down quite a bit. Um, and that was the utility grid shutting their own system down for, uh, for safety reasons. Um, this summer, less of an issue just because weather here has been kind of funky, um, but uh, you know, it still definitely could happen. Um, 
something that has not yet happened, but has been flagged as a possible uh, issue is cyber attacks. So some outside entity shutting down the utility grid. Um, and then the final and kind of most drastic example is the Cascadia seismic hazard, um, which growing up in Portland, I always learned of as the big one, which is the big earthquake that's you know possibly coming. Um, there has been some research research that has shown um, that when this does happen, the grid could be down in Portland for up to six weeks and then outside of Portland no longer than that. Um, so it would be pretty drastic, the effects of this, of this earthquake. So these are some reasons kind of why we care about energy resilience. Um, so creating a system that's most efficient combines solar with storage. So you've got solar on your roof, and then you've got storage inside of your home, and that solar is feeding your storage. So you're creating a system where you're powering your battery, um, and then that battery in turn can power your home. Something that often um, is a misconception is the belief that if you're connected to the utility grid, like most solar systems are, that when the grid goes down, your solar stays on. That is not true. Um, without a battery, when the grid goes down, solar goes down. It's an immediate reaction um, where everything shuts down. So you are not going to be independent with just solar if the grid goes down. You will be offered some level of independence if the grid goes down, if you have a battery along with your solar system. Here are just some examples of some battery selections. This is just kind of showing you that there's some different options out there. Um, we are a brand agnostic nonprofit, so I'm not gonna tell you if any of these are better than the others. Um, we're just trying to show that we've got some, some options out there. Um, and then something to think about, again, another misconception is folks often think if they put a battery in their home, that the battery will be able to power their whole home, like a single battery will. Um, Instead, what we're looking at, one battery is able to provide a partial backup. To have a whole home backup, you'd have to have multiple batteries, um, which is kind of shown here. So we've got one battery versus quite a few. Um, each of those batteries are gonna cost money. So if you have the means to create a whole system backup, that's fine, that's great. Um, often folks do not, which is also understandable. Um, so then what you're gonna have to do is kind of evaluate um, the system size. So what, what can one battery do for you um, and what should it do for you? So you have to kind of think about what needs power and for how long. So say we want to power a refrigerator, some lights, maybe a couple outlets. Um, and then how long do you want to power those for? Uh, if you live in say a colder part of Oregon, if you want to add a um, heater to the mix, um, you can add more things to it, but those are then going to run, be able to run for less time. Um, and so this is just kind of the math that you'll have to do of what needs power, how long, the more add, you add, the less time you can use it for, um, the less you have, then the more time you, you can use it for, but then you might have access to less um, appliances. So it's just something that will have to be thought about and looked at. And again, your solar contractor, your best friend, um, will go over this with you if you do decide to uh, put in a battery. Um, and then this battery is going to be linked to the essential loads panel. And what they'll do is they'll create a special um, circuit that's just gonna run these specific uh, loads through it. And um, that will then, when your power goes on, that comes, powers goes off, excuse me, that goes on. And then hopefully the things that you did choose to um, power, you won't see a difference when the utility goes down. It will just automatically start going. Okay, and then again, kind of one of the more uh, interesting things we, we present on are incentives. So what money is out there for, for you to be able to use? Um, something that's kind of cool to look at is just the national trend of solar panels going down. So um, the price going down, um, we've definitely seen it, a, a decline in price as things become more accessible and affordable, which is awesome. Um, there's always gonna be, you know, this time someone goes into solar, maybe there's going to be some specific costs that they have to think about. Um, but overall, we've definitely seen the pricing gone down. So that's, that's always exciting. Okay, so we've got kind of three major incentives, and we'll go through all of these. Um, you've got the federal solar investment and tax credit incentive, and you've got a solar and storage um, rebate, and that's through the state of Oregon. 
then energy trust, you have some incentives. And those are only for folks who are under the energy trust umbrella. So um, majority of Oregonians, that's gonna be Pacific Power and um, PGE. There's some other utilities in there, but uh, those are the main ones. And what's being offered? Um, so for the federal tax incentive, you've got 26% um, tax credit. Uh, for the state solar and storage rebate, you have up to $5,000. That's just kind of a flat $5,000 rebate. Um, and then energy trust, depending on your utility, you either have $1,200 or $900. Um, for the federal uh, tax credit, um, that one you will have to work on with a uh, tax professional. Um, so these other two, your solar contractor will include into the budget of the quote they give you. Um, but for the solar um, tax credit for the federal level, um, you have to talk to a tax professional. That's something you kind of have to work on on your own. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, there's also through the uh, Energy Trust of Oregon, a solar within reach program. So these are folks who are income qualified. Um, so if you have Pacific Power, it's a uh, dollars per watts um, system. So you get 70 cents per watt and that can be up to $4,200. Um, for PGE, you get $1.40 well, per watt. Um, and so that could be up to $8,400. So these are really great incentives and those are for folks who are income qualified. Um, so that's definitely something worth looking into if you are income qualified. And then the solar and storage rebate. Um, so this is through Oregon um, Department of Energy. Um, so it's kind of $5,000 max. Um, if you want to add storage onto that, you can do both solar and storage, or you can do either solar or storage. Um, but it's $5,000 max for solar. Um, for storage, it's up to $2,500. Um, so for some folks, that could cut could cover over 40% of costs. For other uh, folks who are income qualified, it could cover um, 60% of costs. So that's another really great incentive. Um, and then next, we're just going to look at some sample budgets. Um, so we've got two different columns here. Um, so we've got residential rebate, and those are folks who are not income qualified. And then we've got income qualified folks here. Um, and this is for a home that is under the PGE utility. Um, starting off cost, we've got $20,000. Um, and then we're going to add the energy trust incentive um, that could either be $1,200 or if you have the solar within reach program, that's $8,400 for the income qualified folks. Um, something else to note about this budget, just before I actually truly get into it, is this is just kind of a very basic budget that's available. Um, this is for a six kilowatt home. So that's that average 18 to 20 panels. Um, so this is just trying to show folks what the incentive can do for a standard budget. This is not necessarily hard numbers that you should then apply to your own situation. Um, this is just kind of an example what a budget could look like. Um, so after that energy trust incentive, it's gonna bring our net costs down by quite a bit already. Um, and then we're gonna add that $5,000 flat um, Oregon Department of Energy rebate, um, which is gonna be $5,000. And for these two, the, the rebate and the trust incentive, um, those will be worked on by our solar contractor, like I said before. So, so they'll work on those for you. So you don't really have to worry about those, which is nice. Um, and then it's gonna bring the out-of-pocket cost to customers down to 13,800 or 6,600 for income qualified. And then the final incentive that gets added is that federal tax credit. And again, this is something that you'll have to go over with a tax professional, um, but that's that last credit that's gonna get added. So that brings down your costs by nearly half for non-income qualified folks and definitely more than half um, for income qualified. So incentives are a big help. Um, and then this is another sample budget. This is for folks who are in Pacific Power. Um, so again, starting with $20,000, you've got that energy trust incentive. It's a little less, only 900 or 4,200, but still definitely something. Um, that's gonna bring the net cost down quite a bit, as you can see. And then we've got that $5,000 flat rate, and that's without the storage um, rebate. Brings down the out-of-pocket cost to either 4,100 or 10,800. And then again, the final um, incentive that gets added is gonna be that federal tax credit. So now that you kind of know some information, what are the next steps? How do you get started? Um, so the Energy Trust of Oregon 
has a really great program called the Trade Allies. And what these are, are these are vetted, qualified folks who have been approved by Energy Trust of Oregon um, as a resource. So these are those solar contractors I was talking about. In order to get the Energy Trust incentive, so the solar within reach or just the standard Energy Trust incentive, you do have to go through the um, Trade Ally program. However, it's in your best interest to, to use this program just because you're working with professionals who you know are qualified, you know have been vetted. Um, and then the next step is to request a quote. So I'm gonna put some links into the chat um, to see. I see there's some comments in here. That's totally great. If you could take those questions and put them into the Q and A, um, I'll go through that in just a moment. Um, but I'm gonna re-put in some of those links and uh, these offer um, ways for folks to get to the solar bid tools. So that's what this is. It's a really quick and easy way for folks to get some bids, get some quotes. So as I said in the beginning, you can get in touch with some folks to multiple different um, solar contractors. This is how to do it. So you just fill out some basic information and then it gets you in touch with some solar contractors who are gonna give you different bids. And like I said, each one will have a different kind of standard practice, um, but uh, it's really awesome to see kind of some different, some different options that they can give you. And this is free, which we love. Okay, and then when it is time for installation, um, there's a contractor, kind of all that pre-work is gonna be done by your solar contractor. Installation itself only takes up uh, one to two days, which is awesome. Um, where kind of the lag time is, is getting all that paperwork complete. So that could take up to a couple of months. Um, however, that will be worked on by the contractor for you, which is really great. So during those months, there's not a whole lot you have to worry about. Um, just kind of being in communication with that contractor, and then installation is really quick and easy, one to two days. And then the uh, contractor should be able to manage inspections from that point onward. So you'll continue a relationship with those solar contractors. Okay, thank you everyone. That was a lot of information. Um, I'm gonna start going through some of these questions. Um, as I go through the questions, I'm gonna put one final poll. Um, take your time answering this. I'm just gonna keep it running as I answer questions. Um, so yeah, alrighty. Okay, so we have a question here that says, do I have any rights to solar access if my neighbors have tall trees? Um, so I think what this, this person's asking is, is what, um, what rights they have depending on their, on their neighbor's setup. Um, so if, you're, if your neighbors have tall trees, I don't think there's a whole lot you can do. Um, part of the reason why folks wanna go solar is you know, to, to help the environment. Um, and we definitely don't wanna be tearing down trees or anything like that uh, to, to help the environment um, or, you know. But uh, it's definitely something that would be worth talking to your solar contractor about, because again, they might be able to offer insights if there's a better spot for you to put your solar panels, um, things like that. Uh, but that's, that's definitely a good question. Um, the next question is, are there specific roof lines and their alignment needed? Um, I, I think this maybe is talking about angles and in some, some roof kind of structures. Um, I believe the optimal angle, I think is like 47 or 45 degrees, I wanna say, but really anything works. Um, you can have a super steep roof and still have access to solar. Um, you can have a flat roof and still have solar. Um, when the solar panels get put in on your roof, they get put in, um, there's a little, oh, I'm trying to think of the name, but this little kind of um, pipe thing, and that, that's what's creating the space. And that can get added at different angles to where you have different solar access. So it can be shorter and steeper or longer and more flat. Um, so solar contractors and the people who install the solar, they'll work with the roof you have. Um, and again, this is something that will be in those initial conversations with your solar contractor. Um, we have a question about how can I select a reputable solar professional? Um, that was those those uh, trade allies. They're definitely reputable. They're they're a great great resource. Okay, we answered that one. Um, we have a question here. Can you add batteries over time? Um, yes, 
Yes, you can. Um, if you have a solar uh, array already put in, you can add batteries to that. Um, something that you will want to talk to your solar contractor about is any possible future costs. So when you're creating that system size, so if you know you want to put in a battery or maybe you know you want to add an electric vehicle, um, that's something to tell them. So then when they're creating that system size, they can have that in mind um, when thinking about different uh, you know, needs and making sure that those are all being met. But you can add a, a battery later um, to a solar project. Okay, so we have a question about if a, um, there's a grid failure, um, what good is a battery backup unless it charges independently of the grid, still allowing for energy independence? So um, it will, it, it does do that. So if you think about it, um, the way I like to think about it is you kind of have two different systems set up. So if you're connected with a utility grid, you have kind of this cycle of energy to utility grid, utility grid back to your home. Um, and then when you're adding a battery, you're going to add kind of another offshoot kind of connection or circuit, if you will. So when the grid goes down, that circle is then going to connect to your battery. So it's still able to function with that battery. So you're keeping that circuit um, still full and connected. Whereas if the grid went down on this other circuit, it stops. The, you know, it's not connected anymore. Um, so what that battery is doing is it's offering like a new circuit, a new system for the energy to be used and stored. I hope that answered your question. Um, I think I answered those. Are the bids all inclusive install electrical trust work, not including engineer? Um, yes, they should be. Those, those quotes are going to be fully um, covering all of the different features that the solar contractor will go over with your home. Um, it's in their best interest to give you a quote that's um, truthful because they want customers and you know they want to create a good system. Um, so they'll definitely include all the different po uh, possible costs or, or uh, things that could arise. Um, there's a question, do you know when the state and federal tax credits expire and is the ETI fund plentiful? Um, this is a great question. So I believe, I know that the federal tax credit is going to be going down to 22% um, in 2023. And then I believe, I want to say by 2025, it'll be 10%. And then after 2025, it'll go away. Don't 100% quote me on that. I'm not super positive. Um, it has been re-upped in the past. So it has been um, continued. So that's kind of what we're hoping for, but it will be going down to 22% in 2023. Um, and then whether they're plentiful. Yeah. I mean, it is, there is technically for the state rebate, um, like a pool of money that that's being drawn from. So it's in your best interest to try to go solar sooner rather than later. Um, but that being said, if you wait like a year, there's, there's still money around, um, but it definitely is in your interest to, to get in early. And I think that's just also, if you think about cost savings, the sooner you start saving costs, the more money you save over time. Um, so if that's important to you, which I'll be important to all of us. Uh, that's definitely something to consider. Will these slides be available after your excellent presentation? Well, I appreciate the use of the word excellent. Um, yes, and the video. So I'll be sending all this out. So this will this will be available to you. Um, so no worries there. Can you provide an estimate for a single battery installed? So batteries can range anywhere from like $8,000 to like $2,000. Um, sorry, not $2,000, $20,000. Um, it depends on the company you go with, the size of battery, um, whether you're gonna use that store, um, storage rebate. Um, so yeah, there is definitely a range, um, but my, from the research I've done, Again, not hard numbers, but I believe it's around mid thousands to, to, to about 20,000 on the, on the higher end.
Um, that is a good question. There's a question about roof companies who will assess the roof life of homes. Um, that's something that you might want to ask your solar contractor about because often they have really good relationships in the industry. Um, and that's something that they will be able to help you with. Personally, I don't know of any, um, but it's definitely something that uh, those trade allies will have worked on and have had relationships with folks in the past. So it's definitely worth, worth asking them about. Okay, we have about five more questions. Um, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing great on time. Um, but if you had your, your question answered, you're welcome to head out. That's totally fine. Um, but if you want to stick around, that's also great. We'd love to have you. Okay, are there any design professionals, um, architects or engineers who specialize in solar installation for residences? Um, yes, there are. There's a lot of, there's a lot of companies. Green Hammer um, is a company that is a, a design firm, an architect firm in here in Portland. Um, they have a lot of projects that, that utilize and prioritize solar installations. Um, yeah, there's, there's other great options that I'm blanking on right now, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of great companies that um, are, are utilizing solar and trying to make it more of a um, standard feature in, in their builds and in their homes that they're creating, um, just because there's such a movement towards solar and people are realizing the cost benefit. Um, and also that it, it often in increases the value of a home. So it's in folks best interest to, to kind of include solar in their builds. But yeah, there's definitely companies out there. Oh, that's a good question. In relation to batteries, should they be stored inside or can they be stored outside in a shed, temp controlled? Um, so something that I, I definitely did not explain very well was they are, they are gonna be connected to your electrical panel. Um, so they're typically stored wherever your electrical panel is. Um, so the inverter and the battery will both be connected to that electrical panel. So that's, that's a good question, but um, because they are gonna be linked to those circuits, like I said, and it's gonna create um, those, uh, oh, it's called like specialized circuit. Oh, no, it has a special name. Anyway, that like special circuit that I was saying that you'll run the power through that will be switched on when your grid goes off, it has to be connected to your electrical panel. Um, so wherever that is, your battery will be. The example, um, there's a question about the example of cost include a battery or is it just a basic system? That was just a basic system. It did not include a battery. That's a good, good question. So there's a question, um, are there incentives to replace the roof when installing solar? Um, I'm not sure if there's specific roof incentives. I do know that um, that federal tax credit some of that percentage can include um, any sort of retrofitting, or maybe not any, but some retrofitting to your home if you can prove that it's for solar or for being, you know, putting in some of these renewable um, energies. So uh, some of that 26% can go to cover um, roof life. That being said, I have to say this. I am not a tax professional. Um, so that's something that you'd wanna go over with a tax professional when you're putting that in, um, slash maybe doing some research. Um, but I do, I do believe that they're, they're, that incentive can help cover some roof costs um, if you can prove that the roof is so you can put in solar. This is a great question. What about um, installing solar in historic districts? My most efficient southern exposure is a street side, but it's also very small area. On that note, is east or west better to install if you had to choose? Um, that's a great question. There's a couple different parts to it. I know um, historical, historical districts, or if you have an historic home, um, there can be some extra kind of codes and, and um, barriers possibly to going solar. Um, I'm gonna keep bringing them into it, but that's something that the solar contractor should be able to go over with you. Um, so Southern facing is street side, but it's small area. Um, 
East and West are great options. So I don't want folks to think that East and West are not great options. South is the best, but that does not mean that East and West are in any way bad or won't be able to, to function in the East or West. Um, so yes, those are both fine options if you have more space there. Is a metal roof better than an asphalt roof for installation of solar? Um, so solar can be put on any roof, metal, asphalt, I believe even like wooden um, or terracotta, is that the, the like California style? Um, metal is maybe better in the sense that you will have to replace it less often than asphalt. So the roof age and roof life is longer. Um, so in that regard, it might be, it might be better, um, but functionally, solar panels can be put on any type of roof. Um, that's the only kind of benefit I could think of for metal versus other roof, roof types. Um, and then the last question is, how much does ambient temperature affect batteries? I'm going to be honest, I do not know the answer to that. Um, so I'm going to put my, um, I'm gonna end this poll. I'm gonna put my um, email, it should be in the chat and I'll put it right here. Um, so the person who asked that question, if you wanna email me, feel free and I'll do some research on my own and I'll try to get that information for you. I'm just not sure right now and I don't wanna give you an answer that's incorrect um, and lead you astray. Um, but that's a great question about, about temperature. Okay, we have now reached the um, end of our, of our webinar. Um, Thank you so much for folks who have come in. If you have any more questions, you can throw them in the Q&A, but I think we covered a lot. So there's a lot of really great questions and I appreciate everyone's participation. Um, we finished up a little early, so go team. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, please send me an email. Um, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I, I hope this has been helpful to everyone um, and thank you all and, and have a great day. All right, I'm gonna uh, end, I'm gonna stop sharing, and I'm gonna end the uh, the webinar. So, oh wait, uh, to do. Okay, there's a link to the contractor estimate that's gonna be in the chat, so I can add those links one more time. But if you scroll through, um, that's gonna be the the link that says solar bid tool. That will get you in touch with those uh, solar contractors. The solar bid tool. Alrighty. All right, bye folks, you have a great day.